A Sunflower by William Blake Read for the LibriVox.org by Itel Bus Ah, sunflower, weary of time, Who countest the steps of the sun, Seeking after that sweet golden clime, Where the traveler's journey is done, Where the youth pined away with desire, and the pale virgin shroud in snow arise for the graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go end of poem this recording is in the public domain the old wife by charles stuart calverley Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Part One. The old wife sat at her ivied door, butter and eggs and a pound of cheese, a thing she had frequently done before, and her spectacles lay on her aproned knees. The piper he piped on the hilltop high, butter and eggs and a pound of cheese, till the cow said i die and the goose asked why and the dog said nothing but searched for fleas the farmer he strode through the square farmyard butter and eggs and a pound of cheese his last brew of ale was a trifle hard the connection of which with the plot one sees the farmer's daughter hath frank blue eyes butter and eggs and a pound of cheese she hears the rooks caw in the windy skies as she sits at her lattice and shells her peas the farmer's daughter hath ripe red lips butter and eggs and a pound of cheese if you try to approach her away she skips over tables and chairs with apparent ease the farmer's daughter hath soft brown hair butter and eggs and a pound of cheese and i met with a ballad i can't say where which wholly consisted of lines like these part two she sat with her hands neath her dimpled cheeks butter and eggs and a pound of cheese and spake not a word while a lady speaks there is hope but she didn't even sneeze she sat with her hands neath her crimson cheeks butter and eggs and a pound of cheese she gave up mending her father's breeks and let the cat roll in her best chemise she sat with her hands neath her burning cheeks butter and eggs and a pound of cheese and gazed at the piper for thirty weeks then she followed him out o'er the misty leaves her sheep followed her as their tails did them butter and eggs and a pound of cheese and this song is considered a perfect gem and as to the meaning it's what you please and a poem this recording is in the public domain. An Autumn Rain Scene by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Wallace There trudges one to a merry-making With a sturdy swing on whom the rain comes down To fetch the saving medicament Is another bent on whom the rain comes down one slowly drives his herd to the stall ere ill befall on whom the rain comes down this bears his missives of life and death with quickening breath on whom the rain comes down one watches for signals of wreck or war from the hill afar on whom the rain comes down no care if he gain a shelter or none unhired moves one on whom the rain comes down and another knows naught of its chilling fall upon him at all, on whom the rain comes down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
La Belle Dame Sans Merci by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Ratandeep Satwan Singh Jamshedpur, India La Belle Dame Sans Merci Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe-begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose, fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and then she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses four, and there she lulled me asleep. And there I dreamed, ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hill's side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloom with horrid warning gaped wide. And I awoke and found me here on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Betty by Lola Ridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Betty. You can see the sand hills from our new room. Butterflies live in the sand hills, and lizards and centipedes. If you keep very still, lizards will think you a stone and run over your lap. Butterflies' liveries are scarlet and black. They drive chariots in air. People in the chariots are pale as dew. You can see right through them. But the chariots are made of gold of the sun. They go up to heaven and never catch fire. There are green centipedes and brown centipedes and black centipedes because green and brown and black are the colors in hell's flag. Centipedes have hundreds of feet because it is so far from hell to come up for air. Centipedes do not hurry. They are waiting for the last day when they will creep over the false prophets who will have their hands tied. Night calls to the sand hills and gathers them under her. She pushes away cities because their sharp lights hurt her soft breast. Even candles make a sore place where they stick in the night. There are things in the sand hills that no one knows about. They come out at dark when the young snakes play and tell each other secrets in the deaf logs. Sometimes, before rain, when the stars have gone inside, the night comes close to your window and sniffs at the light. But you must not run away. You must keep your face to the night and walk backward. When it rains and you are pulling off flies' legs, Mama lets you play houses with Lizzie and Clara because you are the only one and because only ones have to live alone while sisters stay together. Lizzie and Clara give you the dry house and take the one with the leaking roof. 
rain like curly hairpins, blows on Lizzie and Clara's two heads, turned like one head, two mouths spread into one laugh. Lizzie is saying, why don't you want to play, when you feel you'd like to braid the crinkled silver rain into a shining rope, to climb up, and up, and up, into the wet sky, and never see anyone again. Our gate doesn't hang right. It must have pawed at the wind and gotten a kick as the wind passed over. The sitting sky puffs out a gray smoke, and the wind makes a red-striped sound, blowing out straight. But our gate drags its foot and winds to itself on one hinge. What do you think I've found? Two wee knickers of fairy brass, or two gold sovereigns folded up in a bit of green silk, or two gold bugs in little green shirts. If you want to know, you must walk tiptoe, so your feet just whisper in the grass. You must carry them careful and very proud, for their stems bleed drops of milk. But Lizzie and Clara shout in glee. Pee a bed, pee a bed, dandelions. You look in the eyes of grown-up people to see if they feel the way you feel, but they hide inside of themselves, and so you do not find out. Grown-up people say, the stars are bright tonight, but they do not say what you are thinking about stars. Not even Mama says what you are thinking about stars. This makes you feel very lonely. It's strange about stars. You have to be still when they look at you. They push your song inside of you with their song. Their long, silvery rays sink into you and do not hurt. It is good to feel them resting on you like great white birds. And their shining whiteness doesn't burn like the sun. It washes all over you and makes you feel cleaner in water. My doll Janie has no waist, and her body is like a tub with feet on it. Sometimes I beat her, but I always kiss her afterwards. When I have kissed all the paint off her body, I shall tie a ribbon about it, so she shan't look shabby. But it must be blue. It mustn't be pink. Pink shows the dirt on her face that won't wash off. I beat Janie and beat her, but still she smiled. So I scratched her between the eyes with a pen. Now she doesn't love me any more. She scowls and scowls, though I begged her to forgive me and poured sugar in the hole at the back of her head. Mama says Janie is a fairy doll, and she has forgiven me that she's gone to the market to buy me some sweets. Now she's at the door, and a little bag tied to her neck. I run to Janie and kiss her all over. Ah, she is still frowning. I let the sweets drop on the floor. Mama has told you a lie. Chinaman singing in the street. Clean lettuces, clean lettuces. Hot sun shining on your face. It must be a new day. But why aren't you happy if it's a new day? Because something has happened, something sad and terrible. Now I remember, it's Janie. Yesterday, I took Janie out and tied my handkerchief over her face and put sand in it and threw her into the ditch, down in the black water under the dock leaves, and when Mama asked me where Janie was, I said I had lost her. I'm glad it is night time, so I'll be able to go to sleep and forget all about it. But Mama looks at my tongue and says she will give me senna tea. When you smell the tea, you shut your eyes tight and pretend not to hear the soft, cool voice of Mama that goes over your forehead like a little wind. And then you lie in the dark and stare and stare till the faces come, yellow faces with leering eyes drifting in a green mist. I wonder if Janie sees faces out there, alone in the dark. I wonder if she has got the handkerchief off or if the water has gone in the hole where the whistle was at the back of her head and drowned her, or if the stars can see her under the dock leaves. It's smoky blue and still over the red road. Wind must be lying down with its tail under it. Doesn't even flick off the flies, and you can hear the silence buzzing in the gum trees the way the angels buzz when they flew through the cedars of Lebanon with thin gauze wings you could see through. Nice to hear the silence buzzing till it comes too close and booms in your ears and presses all over you till you scream. When you scream at the silence, it goes to jingling pieces like a silver mirror broken into tiny bits. 
Perhaps its wings are made of glass. Perhaps it lives down in a dark, dark cave and only comes up to warm its wings in the sun. It's cold in the cave, no matter how you cover yourself up. Little girls sit there, dressed in white, and the dolls in their arms all have white handkerchiefs over their faces. Their shadows cannot play with them. Their shadows lie down at their feet, for the little girls sit stiff as stones, with their backs to the mouth of the cave, where a little light falls off the wings of the silence, when it comes down out of the sun. Moon catches the flying fish as they dive in the bay. Flying fish spin over and over, slippity silver into the water. Morn bends over jungles and touches the foreheads of tigers as they pass under openings made by dropped leaves. Tigers stop on the trail of the deer while the moon is on their foreheads. They let the stags go by. Moon is shining strangely on the white palings of the fence. Fence keeps very still. Most times it moves a little. Everything moves a little, though you mayn't know it. But now the little fence wouldn't change places with a great cross that stands so stiff and high with its back to the moon. Moon shining strangely on the white palings of the fence. I am shining too, but my light is shut inside of me and can't get out. Old house with black windows. Blind house begging moonlight to put out the shadows. Why do you want so much light? You creak when the wind steps on you. You cough up dust and your beams ache. You know you will soon fall. The moon just pities you. Don't waste yourself, moon. Come on my bed and play with me. Wrap me up in blue light, you who are cool. I am too hot. I am all alive, and the shadows are outside of me. There are different kinds of shadows. The blind ones are the shadows of things. These are the tame shadows. They love to play on the wall with you and follow you about like cats and dogs. Sometimes they hiss at you softly like snakes that do not bite or swish like women's dresses. But if you poke a candle at them, they pull in their heads and disappear. But there is a shadow that is not the shadow of a thing. It is a thing itself. When you meet this shadow, you must not look at it too long. It grows with your looking at it till you are all alone, with nothing around you, nothing, 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 but a shadow with its eyes full of black light. There's a shadow in the corner of the shed, crouching, lying in wait, a black coiled shadow, watching, ready to strike, but I mustn't be afraid of it. I mustn't be afraid of anything. Poor evil shadow, the candle would chase it away, only she can't get at it. Do you think that everyone hates you? shadow with your back to the wall, afraid to lie down and sleep. But I don't hate you. Even the moon means to be kind. She just treads on you, as I'd tread on a worm that I didn't see. Don't be afraid of me, shadow. See, I've no light in my hand, nothing to save myself with. Yet I walk right up to you. If you'll let me, I'll put my arms around you and stroke you softly. Are you surprised I put my arms around you? Is it your black black sorrow that nobody loves you? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Companions, A Tale of a Grandfather by Charles Stuart Califerly Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio I know not of what we pondered, or made pretty pretense to talk, as, her hand within mine, we wandered toward the pool by the lime-tree walk, while the dew fell in showers from the passion-flowers, and the blush-rose bent on her stalk. I cannot recall her figure. Was it regal as Juno's own? or only a trifle bigger than the elves who surround the throne of the fairy queen, and are seen, I ween, by mortals in dreams alone. What her eyes were like I know not. Perhaps they were blurred with tears, and perhaps in your skies there glow not, on the contrary, clearer spheres. 
no as to her eyes i am just as wise as you or the cat my dears her teeth i presume were pearly but which was she brunette or blonde her hair was it quaintly curly or as straight as a beetle's wand that i failed to remark it was rather dark and shadowy round the pond then the hand that reposed so snugly in mine was it plump or spare was the countenance fair or ugly nay children you have me there my eyes were perhaps blurred and besides i'd heard that it's horribly rude to stare and i was i brusque and surly or oppressively bland and fond was i partial to rising early or why did we twain abscond when nobody knew from the public view to prowl by a misty pond what passed what was felt or spoken whether anything passed at all and whether the heart was broken that beat under that sheltering shawl if shawl she had on which i doubt has gone yes gone from me past recall was i haply the lady's suitor or her uncle i can't make out ask your governess dears or tutor for myself i'm in hopeless doubt as to why we were there who on earth we were and what this is all about and the poem this recording is in the public domain a coronet for his mistress philosophy by george chapman read for librivox dot org by cynthia moyer muses that sing love's sensual empery and lovers kindling your enraged fires at cupid's bonfires burning in the eye blown with the empty breath of vain desires you that prefer the painted cabinet before the wealthy jewels it doth store ye that all your joys in dying figures set and stain the living substance of your glory abjure those joys abhor their memory and let my love the honoured subject be of love and honour's complete history your eyes were never yet let in to see the majesty and riches of the mind but dwell in darkness for your god is blind but dwell in darkness for your god is blind humour pours down such torrents on his eyes which as from mountains fall on his base kind and eat your entrails out with ecstasies colour whose hands for faintness are not felt can bind your waxen thoughts in adamant and with her painted fires your heart doth melt which beat your souls in pieces with a pant but my love is the cordial of souls teaching by passion what perfection is in whose fixed beauties shine the sacred scroll and long lost records of your human bliss spirit to flesh and soul to spirit giving love flows not from my liver but her living love flows not from my liver but her living from whence all stings to perfect love are darted all power and thought of prideful lust depriving her life so pure and she so spotless hearted in whom sits beauty with so firm a brow that age nor care nor torment can contract it heaven's glories shining there do stuff allow and virtue's constant graces do compact it 
her mind, the beam of God, draws in the fires of her chaste eyes from all earth's tempting fuel, which upward lifts the looks of her desires, and makes each precious thought in her a jewel. And as huge fires compressed more proudly flame, so her close beauties further blaze her fame. So her close beauties further blaze her fame, when from the world into herself reflected, she lets her shameless glory in her shame, content for heaven to be of earth rejected. She, thus depressed, knocks at Olympus' gate, and in the untainted temple of her heart doth the divorceless nuptials celebrate twixt God and her, where love's profaned dart feeds the chaste flames of Hymen's firmament, wherein she sacrificeth for her part the robes, looks, deeds, desires, and whole descent of female natures built in shops of art. Virtue is both the merit and reward of her removed and soul-infused regard. Of her removed and soul-infused regard, with whose firm species as with golden lances she points her life's field for all wars prepared and bears one chanceless mind in all mischances the inverted world that goes upon her head and with her wanton heels doth kick the sky my love disdains though she be honoured and without envy sees her empery loathes all her toys and thoughts cupidinine arranging in the army of her face all virtue's forces to dismay loose ein that hold no quarter with renown or grace war to all frailty peace of all things pure her look doth promise and her life assure her look doth promise and her life assure a right line forcing a rebateless point in her high deeds through everything obscure to full perfection not the weak disjoint of female humours nor the protean rages of pied-faced fashion that doth shrink and swell working poor men like waxen images and makes them apish strangers where they dwell can alter her titles of primacy courtship of antic gestures brainless jests blood without soul of false nobility nor any folly that the world infests can alter her who with her constant guises to living virtues turns the deadly vices to living virtues turns the deadly vices for covetous she is of all good parts incontinent for still she shows entices to consort with them sucking out their hearts proud for she scorns prostrate humility and gluttonous in store of abstinence drunk with extractions stilled in fervency from contemplation and true continence burning in wrath against impatience and sloth itself for she will never rise from that all-seeing trance the band of sense wherein in view of all soul's skill she lies no constancy to that her mind doth move nor riches to the virtues of my love nor riches to the virtues of my love nor empire to her mighty government which fair analyzed in her beauty's grove shows laws for care and canons for content and as a purple tincture given to glass by clear transmission of the sun doth taint opposed subjects so my mistress's face 
doth reverence in her viewers brows depaint and like the pansy with a little veil she gives her inward work the greater grace which my lines imitate though much they fail her gifts so high and time's conceit so base her virtues then above my verse must raise her for words want art and art wants words to praise her for words want art and art wants words to praise her yet shall my active and industrious pen wind his sharp forehead through those parts that raise her and register her worth past rarest women herself shall be my muse that well will know her proper inspirations and assuage with her dear love the wrongs my fortunes show which to my youth bind heartless grief in age herself shall be my comfort and my riches and all my thoughts i will on her convert honour and error which the world bewitches shall still crown fools and tread upon desert and never shall my friendless verse envy muses that fame's loose feathers beautify muses that fame's loose feathers beautify and such as scorn to tread the theatre as ignorant the seed of memory have most inspired and shown their glories there to noblest wits and men of highest doom that for the kingly laurel bent a fair the theatres of athens and of rome have been the crowns and not the base impair far then be this foul cloudy-browed contempt from like-plumed birds and let your sacred rhymes from honour's court their servile feet exempt that live by soothing moods and serving times and let my love adorn with modest eyes muses that sing love's sensual emperies lucidius olim end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Death of the Hired Man by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Ostry Fingerhut The Death of the Hired Man Mary sat, musing, on the lamp flame at the table, waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news, and put him on his guard. Silas is back. She pushed him outward with her through the door, and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. She took the market things from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last haying, didn't I? If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbor him at his age for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes, always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay. Enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say, I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself, if that was what it was. You can be certain when he begins like that, there's someone at him trying to coax him off with pocket money in hang time when any help is scarce. In winter he comes back to us. I'm done. Shh! Not so loud. He'll hear you, Mary said. I want him to. He'll have to soon or late. He's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose I found him here, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. A miserable sight. And frightening, too. You needn't smile didn't recognize him. I wasn't looking for him, and he's changed. Wait till you see. 
Where did you say he'd been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house, and gave him tea, and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? A little. Anything. Mary, confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren. But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture, too. That sounds like something you have heard before. Warren, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. He made me feel so queer to see if he was talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson. You remember the boy you hadn't hanged four years since? He's finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they two will make a team for work. Between them they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he mixed that in with other things. He thinks young Wilson a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they fought. All through July, under the blazing sun. Silas up on the cart to build the load. Harold along beside to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days trouble Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would. How some things linger. Harold's young college boy assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees he might have used. I sympathize. I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what I thought of Harold, saying, He studied Latin like the violin, because he liked it. That an argument. He said he couldn't make the boy believe he could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that. But most of all, he thinks if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know that Silas is one accomplishment. He bundles every forkful in its place, and tags and numbers it for future reference, so he can find and easily dislodge it in the unloading. Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches like big bird's nests. You never see him standing on the hay. He's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas. So concerned for other folk. And nothing to look backward to with pride. And nothing to look forward to with hope. So now and never any different. Part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the harp-like morning-glory strings, taut with the dew from garden-bed to eaves, as if she played unheard the tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course he's nothing to us, any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods, worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back, and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has better claim on us, you think, than on his brother. Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why didn't he go there? His brother's rich, a somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to that if there is need. He ought of right to take him in, and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances. But have some pity on Silas. Do you think if he had any pride in claiming kin, or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time? I wonder what's between them. I can tell you. 
Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as any one. He won't be made ashamed to please his brother, worthless though he is. I can't think Si ever hurt any one. No. But he hurt my heart, the way he lay and rolled his old head on that sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'll be surprised at him, how much he's broken. His working days are done, I'm sure of it. I'd not be in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go. Look. See for yourself. But, Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, and then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were three there, making a dim row. The moon, the little silver cloud, and she. Warren returned, too soon it seemed to her, slipped to her side, caught up her hand, and waited. Warren, she questioned. Dead, was all he answered. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Drinking Song by John Fletcher Read for LibriVox.org by Ashley Jane Drink today and drown all sorrow. You shall perhaps not do it tomorrow. Best while you have it, use your breath. There is no drinking after death. Wine works the heart up, wakes the wit. There is no cure against age but it. It helps the headache, cough and tisic, and is for all diseases physic. Then let us swill, boys, for our health. Who drinks well, loves the commonwealth, and he that will to bed go sober, falls with the leaf still in October. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Theories by Rose Fileman Read for LibriVox.org by Simon Christchurch, New Zealand. There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. It's not so very, very far away. You pass the gardener's shed, and you just keep straight ahead. I do so hope they've really come to stay. There's a little wood with moss in it and beetles, and a little stream that quietly runs through. You wouldn't think they'd dare to come merrymaking there. Well, they do. There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. They often have a dance on summer's nights. The butterflies and bees make a lovely little breeze, and the rabbits stand about and hold the lights. Did you know that they could sit upon the moonbeams and pick a little star to make a fan and dance away up there in the middle of the air? Well, they can. There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. You cannot think how beautiful they are. They all stand up and sing when the fairy queen and king come gently floating down upon their car. The king is very proud and very handsome. The queen, now can you guess who that could be? She's a little girl all day, but at night she steals away. Well, it's me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Farewell to Arms to Queen Elizabeth by George Peel Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page His golden locks time hath to silver turned. O time too swift, O swiftness never ceasing. His youth gainst time and age hath ever spurned, But spurned in vain. Youth waneth by increasing, Beauty, strength, youth are flowers but fading seen. Duty, faith, love are roots and evergreen. His helmet now shall make a hive for bees, And lovers' sonnets turned to holy psalms. 
A man at arms now must serve on his knees, And feed on prayers which are age his alms. But though from court to cottage he depart, His saint is sure of his unspotted heart. And when he saddest sit in homely cell, He'll teach his swains this carol for a song. Blessed be the hearts that wish my sovereign well, Cursed be the souls that think her any wrong. Goddess, allow this aged man his right To be your beadsman now, that was your knight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. L'Homme de la Nuit by Matilda Betham Read for LibriVox.org by Cynthia Moyer Forlornly I wander, forlornly I sigh, And droop my head sadly, I cannot tell why. When the first breeze of morning blows fresh in my face, As the wild waving walks of our woodlands I trace, Revived for the moment, I look all around, But my eyes soon grow languid and fix on the ground. I have yet no misfortune to rob me of rest, No love discomposes the peace of my breast. Ambition ne'er entered the verge of my thought, Nor by honours, by wealth, nor by power am I caught. Those phantoms of folly disturb not my ease, Yet time is a tortoise, and life a disease. With the blessings of youth and of health on my side, A temper untainted by envy or pride, No guilt to corrode, and no foes to molest, There are many who tell me my station is blessed. This I cannot dispute, yet without knowing why, I feel that my bosom is big with a sigh. Oh, why do I see that all knowledge is vain, That science finds error still keep in her train, That imposture or darkness, with doubt and surmise, Will mislead, will perplex, and then baffle the wise, Who often, when labors have shortened their span, Declare, not to know is the province of man. In life as in learning our views are confined, Our discernment too weak to discover the mind, Which subdued and irresolute keeps out of sight, Or if for a moment her presence delight, Our air is too gross for the stranger to stay, and back to her prison she hurries away. If my own narrow precincts I seek to explore, my wishes how vain, my attainments how poor. Tenacious of virtue, with caution I move, I correct and I wrestle, but cannot approve, till bewildered and faint I would yield up the rein, but I dare not in peace with my errors remain. With zeal all awake in the cause of a friend, With warmth unrepressed by my fear to offend, With sympathy active in hope or distress, How keen and how anxious I cannot express. I shrink lest an eye should my feelings behold, And my heart seems insensible, selfish, and cold. I strive to be gay, but my efforts are weak, and sick of existence, for pleasure I seek. I mix with the empty, the loud, and the vain, partake of their folly, and double my pain. In others I meet with depression and strife, O oh, where shall I seek for the music of life? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
A Hungry Day by Isabella Crawford Read for LibriVox.org by Grant Herlock I mind him well. He was a queer old chap, come like meself from sweet old Aaron's sod. He hired me once to help his harvest in. The crops was fine that summer, praised be God. He found us rosy, Mickey and meself, just landed in the immigration shed. Meself was tying on their bits of clothes. Their mother, rest her tender soul, was dead. It's not meself can say of what she died, but twas the year the Pratties felt the rain and rotted in the soil. And just to draw the breath of life was one long hungry pain. If we were heathens in a foreign land, not in a country grand in Christian pride, faith, then a man might have the face to say, twas of starvation my poor Shyly died. But when the parish doctor came at last, when death was like a sunburst in her eyes, they looked straight into heaven, and her ears were deaf to the poor children's hungry cries. He touched the bones stretched on the moldy straw. She's gone, he says, and drew a solemn frown. I fear, my man, she's dead. Of what, says I? He coughed and says, she's let her system down. And that's God's truth, says I, and felt about to touch her dawny hand, for all looked dark. And in my hunger bleached small beating heart, I felt the kindlin' of a burning spark. Oh, by me soul, that is the holy truth. There's Rosie's cheek has kept a dimple still, and Mickey's eyes are bright. The crather there died that the weeny ones might eat their fill. And when they spread the daisies thick and white above her head that once lay on my breast, I had no tears but took the children's hands and says we'll leave the mother to her rest. And ach, the sod was green that summer's day and rainbows crossed the low hills, blue and fair, but black and foul the blighted furrows stretched, and sent their cruel poison through the air, and all was quiet on the sunny sides of hedge and ditch the starvin crathers lay, and them as lacked the rent from empty walls of little cabins wapen turned away. God's curse lay heavy on the poor old sod, and when upon her increase his right hand fell witheringly, there seemed no bit of blue for hope to shine through on the stricken land. No factory chimbleys smoked again the sky, no mines yawned on the hills so full and rich. A man whose pratties failed had naught to do but fold his hands and die down in a ditch. A flame rose up within me feeble heart, When passin through me cabin's hingeless door, I saw the mark of Shyly's coffin in The grey dust on the empty earthen floor. I lifted Rosie's face betwixt me hands, Says I, me girlin, you and Mick and me, Must lave the green old sod and look for food In them strange countries far beyond the sea. And so it chanced when landed on the streets, old Dolan, rollin a queer old shay, came there to hire a roan to save his weight, and hired meself and Mickey by the day. And bring the girlin, Pat, he says, and looked at Rosie lanin up agin me knee. The wife will be right pleased to see the child, the weeny shamrock from beyond the sea. We've got a tidy place, the saints be praised, As nice a farm as ever broken trod. A hundred acres, us as never owned, Land big enough to make a lark a sod. Bedad, says I, I heard them over there, Tell how the gould was lyin' in the street, And guineas in the very mud that stuck To the old brogans on a poor man's feet. Begora, Pat, says Dolan, may old Nick fly off with them rapscallions, scamin' rogues. 
and send them thrampin' purgatory's floor, with red-hot guineas in their polished brogues. Ach, then, says I, Miss Elf agrees to that. Old Dolan smiled with eyes so bright and grey. Says he, Cape up your heart, I never knew, since I come out, a single hungry day. But then I left the crowded city streets, their men galore to toil in them and die. Meself went with me axe to cut a home in the green woods beneath the clear sweet sky. I did that same, and God be praised this day, plenty sit smiling by me own dear door. And in them years I never once have seen a famished child creep trembling on me floor. I listened to old Dolan's honest words. That's twenty years ago this very spring. And Mick is married, and me Rosie wears a sweetheart's little shinin' golden ring. Twould make your heart lape just to take a look at the green fields upon me own big farm. And God be praised, all men may have the same that owns an axe and has a strong right arm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In School Days by John Greenleaf Whittier Read for LibriVox.org by Ashley Jane Still sits the schoolhouse by the road, a ragged beggar sleeping. Around it still the summocks grow, and blackberry vines are creeping. Within the master's desk is seen, deep scarred by wraps official, the warping floor, the battered seats, the jackknife's carved initial, the charcoal frescoes on its wall, the door's worn sill betraying the feet that creeping slow to school went storming out to playing. Long years ago a winter sun shone over it at setting, lit up its western window panes and low eaves icy fretting. It touched the tangled golden curls and brown eyes full of grieving of one who still her steps delayed when all the school were leaving. For near it stood the little boy, her childish favour singled, his cap pulled low upon a face where pride and shame were mingled. Pushing with restless feet the snow to right and left he lingered, as restlessly her tiny hands the blue-checked apron fingered. He saw her lift her eyes, he felt the soft hands light caressing, and heard the tremble of her voice as if a fault confessing. I'm sorry that I spelt the word. I hate to go above you because... The brown eyes lower fell. Because, you see, I love you. Still memory to a grey-haired man, that sweet child face is showing. Dear girl, the grasses on her grave have forty years been growing. He lives to learn in life's hard school. How few who pass above him lament their triumph and his loss, like her, because they love him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Life Beyond by Rupert Brooke Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson He waits who never thought to wake again, who held the end was death. He opens eyes slowly to one long, livid, oozing plain, closed down by the strange, eyeless heavens. He lies and waits and once in timeless sick surmise through the dead air heaves up an unknown hand like a dry branch no life is in that land himself not lives but is a thing that cries an unmeaning point upon the mud 
a speck of moveless horror an immortal one cleansed of the world sentient and dead a fly fast stuck in grey sweat on a corpse's neck i thought when love for you died i should die it's dead alone most strangely i live on end of poem this recording is in the public domain lines written in early spring by william wordsworth read for librivox.org by ratandeep satwant singh jamshedpur india i heard a thousand blended notes while in a grove i sate reclined in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind to her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man through primrose tufts in that green bower the periwinkle trailed its wreaths and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes the birds around me hopped and played their thoughts i cannot measure but the least motion which they made it seemed a thrill of pleasure the budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air and i must think do all i can that there was pleasure there if this belief from heaven be sent if such be nature's holy plan have i not reason to lament what man has made of man end of poem this recording is in the public domain the long small room by edward thomas read for librivox.org by patrick wallace the long small room that showed willows in the west narrowed up to the end the fireplace filled although not wide i liked it no one guessed what need or accident made them so build only the moon the mouse and the sparrow peeped in from the ivy round the casement thick of all they saw and heard there they shall keep the tale for the old ivy and older brick when i look back i am like moon sparrow and mouse that witnessed what they could never understand or alter or prevent in the dark house one thing remains the same this is my right hand crawling crab-like over the clean white page resting a while each morning on the pillow then once more starting to crawl on towards age the hundred last leaves stream upon the willow end of poem this recording is in the public domain Longing by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Chessy If you could sit with me beside the sea today And whisper with me sweetest dreamings o'er and o'er I think I should not find the clouds so dim and grey And not so loud the waves complaining at the shore If you could sit with me upon the shore today and hold my hand in yours as in the days of old. I think I should not mind the chill baptismal spray, nor find my hand and heart and all the world so cold. If you could walk with me upon the strand today, and tell me that my longing love had won your own, I think all my sad thoughts would then be put away 
and I could give back laughter for the ocean's moan. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love Not Me for Comely Grace by Unknown. Read for LibriVox.org by Charlotte Duckett. Love not me for comely grace, for my pleasing eye or face, nor for any outward part, no, nor for my constant heart, for those may fail or turn to ill, so thou and I shall sever. Keep therefore a true woman's eye, and love me still, but know not why, so hast thou the same reason still, to dote upon me ever. End of poem. This recording's in the public domain. The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes Read for LibriVox.org by Simon Christchurch, New Zealand I've known rivers I've known rivers ancient as the world And older than the flow of human blood in human veins My soul has grown deep like the rivers I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Night by Emily Bront Read for the LibriVox.org by Etel Bus the night is darkening round me, the wide winds coldly blow, but a tyrant spell has bound me, and I cannot, cannot go. The giant trees are bending their bare boughs waiting when the snow, and the storm is fast descending, and yet I cannot go. Clouds beyond clouds above me, wastes beyond wastes below. But nothing drear can move me. I will not, cannot go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Not to Keep by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Jeanette Brown. They sent him back to her. The letter came saying, and she could have him, and before she could be sure there was no hidden ill under the formal writing, he was in her sight, living. They gave him back to her alive. How else? They are not known to send the dead, and not disfigured visibly. His face, his hands, she had to look, to ask, what was it, dear? And she had given all, and still she had all. They had. They the lucky. Wasn't she glad now? Everything seemed one, and all the rest for them permissible ease. And she had to ask, What was it, dear? Enough, yet not enough. A bullet through and through, high in the breast. Nothing but what good care and medicine and rest. And you a week can cure me of to go again. The same grim giving to do over for them both. She dared no more than ask him with her eyes, How was it with him for a second trial? And with his eyes he asked her not to ask. They had given him back to her, but not to keep. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. An Old Memory by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Chessy How sweet the music sounded That summer long ago When you were by my side, love 
to list its gentle flow. I saw your eyes a-shining, I felt your rippling hair, I kissed your pearly cheek, love, and had no thought of care. And gay or sad the music, with subtle charm replete, I found an after years love, t'was you that made it sweet. For standing where we heard it, I hear again the strain, it wakes my heart but thrills it, with sad, mysterious pain. It pulses not so joyous as when you stood with me, and hand in hand we listened to that low melody. Oh, could the years turn back, love? Oh, could events be changed to what they were that time, love, before we were estranged? Wert thou once more a maiden, whose smile was gold to me? Were I once more the lover, whose word was life to thee? O oh God, could all be altered, the pain, the grief, the strife? And wert thou, as thou shouldst be, my true and loyal wife? But all my tears are idle and all my wishes wane. What once you were to me, love, you may not be again. For I, alas, like others, have missed my dearest aim. I asked for love. Oh, mockery! Fate comes to me with fame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poets by T. Randolph Read for LibriVox.org by Charlotte Duckett From witty men and mads all poetry conception had No sires but these will poetry admit Madness or wit This definition of poetry doth fit It is witty madness or mad wit Only these two poetic heats admit A witty man or one who's out of his wits End of poem This recording is in the public domain Rain by Edward Thomas Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen Rain, midnight rain Nothing but the wild rain on this bleak hut And solitude And me remembering again That I shall die And neither hear the rain nor give it thanks for washing me cleaner than I have been since I was born into this solitude. Blessed are the dead that the rain rains upon. But here I pray that none whom once I loved is dying tonight, or lying still awake solitary, listening to the rain either in pain or thus in sympathy helpless among the living and the dead like a cold water among broken reeds myriads of broken reeds all still and stiff like me who have no love which this wild rain has not dissolved except the love of death if love it be towards what is perfect and cannot the tempest tells me disappoint end of poem this recording is in the public domain the siren song by William Brown of Tavistock Read for LibriVox.org By Capricia Page Steer, hither steer your winged pines, All beaten mariners. Here lies love's undiscovered mines, A prey to passengers. 
Perfumes far sweeter than the best Which makes the phoenix urn and nest. Fear not for your ships, Nor any to oppose you save our lips. But come on shore, Where no joy dies Till love hath gotten more. For swelling waves our panting breasts, Where never storms arise, Exchange, and be a while our guests. For stars gaze on our eyes, The compass love shall hourly sing, And as he goes about the ring, We will not miss to tell each point He nameth with a kiss. Then come on shore, where no joy dies till love hath gotten more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song of Myself, Section 26, by Walt Whitman. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Now I will do nothing but listen, to accrue what I hear into this song, to let sounds contribute toward it. I hear the bravures of birds, bustle of growing wheat, gossip of flames, clack of sticks cooking my meals. I hear the sound I love, the sound of the human voice. I hear all sounds running together, combined, fused, or following. Sounds of the city and sounds out of the city, sounds of the day and night, talkative young ones to those that like them, the loud laugh of workpeople at their meals, the angry bass of disjointed friendship, the faint tones of the sick, the judge with hands tight to the desk, his pallid lips pronouncing a death sentence, the heave yo of stevedores unlading ships by the wharves, the refrain of the anchor lifters, the ring of alarm bells, the cry of fire, the whir of swift streaking engines and hose carts with premonitory tinkles and colored lights, the steam whistle, the solid roll of the train of approaching cars, the slow march played at the head of the association, marching two and two, they go to guard some corpse, the flag tops are draped with black muslin. I hear the violin cello, tis the young man's heart's complaint. I hear the keyed cornet, it glides quickly in through my ears, it shakes mad sweet pangs through my belly and breast. I hear the chorus, it is a grand opera, ah, this indeed is music, this suits me. A tenor, large and fresh as the creation, fills me, the orbic flex of his mouth is pouring and filling me full. I hear the trained soprano, what work with hers is this? The orchestra whirls me wider than Uranus flies. It wrenches such ardors from me that I did not know I possessed them. It sails me. I dab with bare feet. They are licked by the indolent waves. I am cut by bitter and angry hail. I lose my breath. Steeped amid honeyed morphine, my windpipe throttled in fakes of death, at length let up again to feel the puzzle of puzzles, and that we call being. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Terminus by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Lucas Ronimus It is time to be old, to take in sail. The god of bounds, who sets to seas a shore, Come to me in his fatal rounds, and said no more. No farther shoot thy broad, ambitious branches and thy root. Fancy departs, no more invent. Contract thy firmament to compass of a tent. There's not enough for this and that. Make thy option which of two. Economize the failing river, not the less revere the giver. Leave the many and hold the few. Timely wise and accept the terms. Soften the fall with wary foot. A little while still plan and smile, and fault of novel germs. Mature the unfallen fruit. Curse if thou wilt thy sires, bad husbands of their fires, who when they gave thee breath, 
failed to bequeath the needful sinew stark as once, the bare sark marrow to thy bones, but left a legacy of ebbing veins, in constant heat and nervousless reigns, amid the muses left thee deaf and dumb, amid the gladiators halt and numb. As the bird trims her to the gale, I trim myself to the storm of time. I man the rudder, reef the sail, obey the voice at eve obeyed at prime. Lowly faithful, banish fear, right onward drive unharmed. The port well worth the cruise is near, and every wave is charmed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Transcence by Sarojini Naidu. Read for LibriVox.org by Tech Savvy. Nay, do not grieve, though life be full of sadness. Dawn will not wail her splendor for your grief nor spring deny their bright appointed beauty to lotus blossom and ashoka leaf nay do not pine though life be dark with trouble time will not pause or tarry on his way to-day that seems so long so strange so bitter will soon be some forgotten yesterday nay do not weep new hopes, new dreams, new faces, the unspent joy of all the unborn years will prove your heart a traitor to its sorrow and make your eyes unfaithful to their tears. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Were I a King, I Could Command Content by Edward de Vere Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Were I a king, I could command content. Were I obscure, unknown should be my cares. And were I dead, no thoughts should me torment. Nor words, nor wrongs, nor loves, nor hopes, nor fears, a doubtful choice of three things, one to crave, a kingdom, or a cottage, or a grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. War Gangs by Carl Sandburg, read for LibriVox.org box cars run by a mile long and i wonder what they say to each other when they stop a mile long on a side track maybe their chatter goes i come from fargo with a load of wheat up to the danger line i come from omaha with a load of short horns and they splintered my boards i come from detroit heavy with a load of flivers i carried apples from the hood river last year and this year bunches of bananas from florida they look for me with watermelons from Mississippi next year. Hammers and shovels of work gangs sleep in shop corners. When the dark stars come on the sky and the night watchmen walk and look. Then the hammerheads talk to the handles. Then the scoops of the shovels talk. How the day's work nicked and trimmed them. How they swung and lifted all day. How the hands of the work gang smelled of hope in the night of the dark stars, when the curve of the sky is a work gang handle, in the night on the mile long side tracks, in the night where the hammers and the shovels sleep in corners. The night watchmen stuff their pipes with dreams, and sometimes they doze and don't care for nothing, and sometimes they search their heads for meanings, stories, stars. The stuff of it runs like this. A long way we come, a long way to go, long rests and long deep sniffs for our lungs on the way. Sleep is a belonging of all. 
even if all songs are old songs and the singing heart is snuffed out like a switchman's lantern with the oil gone even if we forget our names and houses in the finish the secret of sleep is left us sleep belongs to all sleep is the first and last and best of all people singing people with song mouths connecting with song hearts people who must sing or die people whose song hearts break if there is no song mouth these are my people end of poem this recording is in the public domain